Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are just going to wait a one more minute um, for all of our attendees to uh, join us. We are excited to welcome you here today um, to the School of Journalism and Mass Communication um, Emerging Scholars Speaker Series. So uh, we're just going to give it a couple of couple more seconds, um, and then we will uh, then we'll get moving. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Katie Culver. I'm the James E. Burgess Chair in Journalism Ethics in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at UW-Madison. I'm delighted to welcome you today uh, to our inaugural um, uh, talk for our Emerging Scholars Speaker Series. Um, funny enough, this is uh, almost to the day, one year after this talk was supposed to happen. So Danielle Kilgo uh, joins us today as our inaugural speaker. She was supposed to be with us in Madison a year ago, and then this nasty pandemic got in the way. So we are very excited uh, to welcome Danny back. Uh, it's virtually, but when we're all back in person, I swear we'll get her to Madison uh, to round out the in-person visit as well. Uh, so uh, Danny, uh, as you know, um, comes from uh, the University of Minnesota now, formerly at um, Indiana University. Um, as a gopher, uh, we uh, we're happy. We Badgers are happy uh, to welcome her as well. Um, so Danny's research is certainly critically important at uh, this moment in time in our culture. So she focuses on the intersections of race and gender um, when it comes to digital and social media communication. She's concentrating a lot right now, and and we're grateful for this on uh, media coverage of social protest, and that's what we're going to be looking at today um, in this talk. Um, Danny's going to speak to us for about. 30 to 40 minutes, and then we are going to um, have Q&A so that people attendees can ask questions. Rather though than, um, than raising your hand, we'd appreciate it if you would please use the Q&A function. Um, and I will round up those questions and ask them um, of Danny toward the end. So without further ado, uh, Danny, let me ask you to trigger your, your camera and your mic, and we'll turn it over to you to share your slides and get going. Thank you for the unmute reminder. <laughs> 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 you know what? It's funny. We a year later, and we all still need it, right? Um, so welcome, Danny. We're we're delighted to have you, and very much looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, hello, all, and um, thank you for uh, spending the ninety millionth, eight hundred twelfth day of of the pandemic with me this afternoon. Um, and and thank you, Dr. Culver, for the, the gracious introduction and the invitation to speak last year, turned this year. Um, it's quite an honor to be here. Um, a year ago, I had planned to talk about the hierarchy of social struggle, which was a comparative look at the protest paradigm. Um, but we know the story, right? There was a pandemic and here we are uh, a year later. But there also was a racial reckoning with racism too. And I'm lucky that my work, um, most specifically my work that I completed with Dr. Summer Harlow of the University of Houston and Dr. Rachel Morrow at uh, Michigan State University. Um, it's recently received a ton of attention and, um, and has helped with some practical application of, uh, of journalism and, and evolving ethics after the death of George Floyd. Um, and that was kind of a relief to me, uh, but also sort of devastating because I've been studying this for since my first year of my doctoral program. Uh, and a decade later, here we are. Um, so all that said, I uh, what I might have presented then is now older news. And so I'm going to just sort of skim through that um, and uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about some of my, my most recent work, um, which builds on the protest uh, paradigm and really theorizes why it's so stable with anti-racism protest and why I think this hierarchy of social struggle um, that I've theorized in, in some of my previous work uh, will be quite dynamic but persistent um, until we really decide or we really figure out ways to dismantle um, you know, racism and the racist system in which journalism is built. Um, so at the University of Wisconsin, 
uh, the faculty has some uh, legends to say the least. And uh, much of my work on protest builds on one particular legend and that would be uh, Douglas McLeod um, and many of his colleagues that he's worked with as well. Um, <clears throat> his work um, with James Hertog, he really gave us the, the foundation of this multi-perspectival approach to um, how we think about the protest paradigm and how it worked, which is really where my research starts. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to simplify decades of scholars' ideas, which is always problematic, um, but uh, I will simplify that and also how the hierarchy of social struggle works so that I can talk a little bit more about some of these sustainability factors. Um, so uh, the protest paradigm works basically by overemphasizing actions and underemphasizing substance. Uh, this is perceived as negative um, for movements by emphasizing these actions over substance. And there's a lot of ways in which um, this action is is emphasized. Um, people are that it, some of the actions are demonizing, some of the actions are criminalizing, some of them just trivialize protests and, and make them look as if they are a spectacle. And those are those key frames that we see um, associated with the protest paradigm, the riot, confrontation, and spectacle frames. And these are built both by narratives, by words, by official sources, um, by specific language that primes ideas, um, all of which we end up um, labeling delegitimizing. Um, and then there's the heart of the protest that frames um, these agendas and the demands and the grievances of the protest um, or the movement behind it, uh, if that's applicable. applicable. And the emphasis of these particular um, uh, features of, of a protest, this is considered legitimizing. And we see less legitimizing coverage and more delegitimizing coverage for, for protests that challenge the status quo. And that sort of is the basis of, of the protest paradigm. Um, that, that's been very persistent in my work for, for a, uh, a long time and, and, and the work of others who have seen this protest paradigm develop in, in the status quo challenging protest. Um, what we saw in 2020 was a little bit different. And I credit this headline really for this news coverage that I, that I, um, that the, or this, this sort of racial reckoning news moment where my work was uh, more um, well received, I guess, <laughs> in journalism newsrooms. Nobody likes a critic, and I guess that's what I am. So I credit this headline um, and uh, the warrior journalists who are injured during um, the first few weeks of protest this summer um, for you know getting the protest paradigm sort of um, into national conversation. Um, and and that, that police erupt in violence nationwide, it was really it was really important and it was a shift because much of my work had looked for this what happens with police behavior and how to disinterrogate how we understand the paradigm. And it showed up so uh, infrequently that we couldn't include it in 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 models. And um, I, I was in a then a quantitatively trained um, or a quantitatively focused uh, program. And so it was really hard to like, really go back and, and fi figure out what you do with the absence of data. Um, and that's sort of the progression of, of what I've done over time uh, is figure out how to how to include that in, in how we understand statistics. And while this is great, this coverage of police repression and um, and is is definitely, I think, a narrative that is bubbling up. Um, this very same day, we saw sort of the persistence of the paradigm in 2020 up until that point. Um, many of the headlines. This is the so this so that Slate article was May 31st, and this is what the front page looks like um, for the Star Tribune um, on May 31st. And it just kind of shows how tightly knit or tightly held this protest paradigm is. Um, it, as you can see, it uh, definitely emphasizes the confrontation and the spectacle and the, the rioting um, by talking about the massive deployment needing to, needing to quell the rioting, um, talking about, uh, you, you know, fire, fire, fire is down there at the bottom, if you can see it. Um, and then really having less of a emphasis on the grievances and demands of, of why people were there and, and how George Floyd is connected to um, a bigger story. Um, I 
this is just a sort of anecdotal approach. I just completed a study that's under review that sort of confirms that the protest paradigm is going to remain intact, even with the sort of creeping up of uh, police repression narrative and police violence during protest. So my work has found this pattern over and over again um, in the protests that followed Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, and later um, Stefan Clark. So um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Harlow, and I decided we would do some more comparative work in 2017 that was one of the many years of the protests. Um, anyway, that, that year we thought it was going to be the protest year. We were naive, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, we analyzed protest coverage from all the protests that had happened that year. And we did this because you know, a string of scholarship was coming out about the protest paradigm that was really saying that, that, that this was conditional and um, somewhat irrelevant in some cases in the digital age. And, and what we had found out time and time again is just that was not true. Um, and, and, and assuredly, it still is not true. The paradigm held, um, it really did emphasize more of um, the spectacle frame for all of these protests. And, um, but uh, the big takeaway from our comparative um, analysis was that the coverage was more favorable for some protests than others. Um, and what fell down in the bottom ranks is in favorability for those that were covered were the anti-racism and anti-colonialism and protests that sought to decenter white supremacy. It more often fit this paradigm way more often than other protests. And that's really where this hierarchy of social struggle comes from. Um, we argue alongside a lot of people who um, say that this is a product of norms and routines, and this is all built into sort of the system in that way. And we also argue alongside, we have argued alongside scholars who said that um, that more of the legitimizing frame would actually be the solution to this problem, that this would be this would be more legitimizing to the protest and more fair and journalistic practice. Um, but to me, the ethical model of redemption needed more depth, um, especially in a white supremacist system, especially when we're talking about anti racism protest. And that's really what I would like to talk about today is where my, my work has gone from here. So again, we've argued that um, that more legitimizing coverage would cure the paradigm for a long time. Um, and for Black Lives Matter, the emphasis on the substance, the emphasis on social critique and agendas and demands and grievances, the substance is going to have to center racism. It's about white supremacy's continual hold on people of color, and that's been made invisible um, by the reliance of um, of 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 discussing racism and, and centering policy and, and really ch changing the way we understand racism so that it's um, subjective. And I'd like today to highlight just two recent uh, published studies that I've done that sort of problematize the ways in which racism is the problem <laughs> and that we have to reckon with actual racism before we can cure the protest paradigm and really understand how legitimizing this um, debate frame can be. So first, um, I'd like to tackle that journalism has a problem with racism, and that's because society has a problem with racism. One of the very first papers I wrote, sort of a side story, I hope there's some grad students here today. <laughs> um, but one of the very first uh, papers I wrote was about color blindness's influence on society and how people commented on Tea Party Post. And it got rejected from a journal, as many of my papers do. <laughs> um, but um, all of, for all of its flaws, which I'm not saying it's a perfect paper, I, this really has stuck out for me for years. And one reviewer said to me, um, said this to me, and it stuck with me, I mean, just forever. Um, <laughs> apparently, because I pulled a quote for this today. So anyway, um, just, I'll just read it out loud. It says, uh, this paper centers um, color blindness to understand coded commentary used by social media users. And that is dated flawed, uh, that is dated flawed positionality because we are certainly past the color blindness age. No one really bought into that. The no one really bought into that part it was really hard for me to process. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure how to argue with viewer number one because I thought I was supposed to be arguing with viewer number two, actually. But um, anyway, certainly we know that colorblindness, people did buy into colorblindness and they still do. 
Um, and uh, my imposter syndrome really prohibited me from ever sending that paper anywhere else. So grad students, um, I, I want to encourage you to fight and fight on um, if you can. Um, but anyway, the point isn't to rag on re review number anything because uh, really that's what I have Twitter for. Um, but it's also, it, it, it really is to, um, and it's not to say that we haven't evolved since like the broader colorblindness narrative. Um, but I guess the point here is mostly just to argue that colorblindness is still here and its ramifications are still relevant and its ideology is, is still alive. Um, and we have developed variations in epistemology, epistemologies of ignorance that have helped us like really make racism complicated. Um, and there are all kinds of other racist ideologies that help us understand what racism is. Um, so in the academy, um, we have all kinds of different versions of racism and names for it. Um, and they're all a little bit different and nobody really researches all of them and agrees on one specific name or one, one specific boundary. Um, so, uh, so answering the question, what is racism? to figure out how to place it within this paradigm is complicated because it comes in so many forms and it comes from so many experiences and it doesn't just involve derogatory words and lynchings. And even when we do see a ton of modern lynchings passed, um, passed around the globe, uh, much like the postcard lynchings that we saw in the past of vigilante murders, even, even when we do see those, those are not seen as racism which um, I will illustrate a little bit later in, in the talk. Um, all these terms really make um, knowing what racism is really hard for, for most people anyway, and for journalists. And that's, that's kind of the era we're in, this, where, where the debatability of racism replaces racism as a fact um, and as a reality. And it makes it very negotiable no matter where you turn and go. Because of this perceivedly undefined parameters of racism, both in the world and with reviewer number one, right, the debatability of racism is rampant. And um, even, you know, this is a, a discussion that we have among academics too, but there's this hyper discussion of what racism is and what racism isn't. Um, this idea is pulled from Gavin Titley's work, um, a book called Racism in the Media, um, where he says this obsession with this conversation about trying to define the boundaries um, is what is problematic in media coverage or in media generally. Um, that's all relevant because I, I did a study that really wanted to figure out what when racism is called racist. Like when 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 do we use, we use the term right now? How do we understand journalism's role in this debatability? Um, and this really came up after Trump said one of the racist and xenophobic comics that have made headlines in the around the world at some point. And um, you know after after this there was a um, it was a com it was a comment about congresswomen. There was a really extensive like meta discourse among journalists that um, that was talking about when do you call racist thing racist? When do we call call out Trump? When do we call out these issues? And um, you know, lots of people celebrated it as a win uh, when the AP style book decided to um, update its recommendation and say, you know, maybe you shouldn't use racial, racially charged when you know it's racist. Call, definitely call racist things racist. And I, I first of all, you know, I, I really thought that um, that was perhaps the least helpful guideline that they could provide because <laughs> what is racist really? And, and how, do you, how do you modernize it and, and place it where it is? Um, especially after you had, you just spent six years listening to, to lots of political commentary that exploded and expounded upon the, the normalization of racist comments from politicians. Um, so one study that I worked in centered this sentiment. I looked at all the times um, and contexts in which the media called racist things racist, and I borrowed from Tetley's framework to explore all of the all of the news 
that creates this debatability and how the news contributes to this debatability. Um, so I'm just gonna show you some brief results from a content analysis of news posts shared to social media. This included the headline and the summaries and some of the text from the coverage. Um, it's usually about the first two sentences. Um, and I pulled all of the coverage that had the word racist or racism in it um, and looked, looked for uh, what, what it's associated with. I used uh, both standard content analysis and um, to identify what I call subjectivity cues and then topic modeling to link them with topics and events. Um, these are those subjectivity cues that I, that I argue trigger this debatability. Um, so I looked for, of course, race, journalists calling racist things actually racist or racism, just owning it, right? And then these subjectivity cues included scare quotes, which was really the thing that that really the thing that generated a lot of the meta discourse about calling racist things racist. Um, rhetorical indicators like allegedly or supposedly external attributions or quotations, articles um, and articles marked as opinion, and then. Um, a few deniability characteristics that engage with debatability by making racism subjective by allowing people to deny them, right? Um, and one of the things I looked for was just a flat out denial of, but I'm not, the, you know, I'm, but I'm not racist, but I'm the least racist person in the world, these kinds of denials. And then reverse racism, which pushes against the very definition of racism that uh, includes this systematic and, um, or the systemic and institutional force that it, that it holds and carries. And then with the topic modeling, I used uh, Microsoft Azure to uh, just uh, find key topics. What I ended up having to do is uh, divide it into subjects and then topics of racism. So um, I have these topics where, there, where racism and racist is mentioned, and it's uh, predominantly in, in, with Trump, politicians, celebrities, and police. Um, and then these topics of racism, um, which are white privilege, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, anti-immigration, anti-Black racism, Blackface, um, foreign or international racism, um, sexism, history, and then racism from universities and schools. Um, importantly, history is one that many scholars have said is, is problematic, like this confinement of racism in history makes a lot of people think that like the, you know, the 1960s, um, uh, policy reforms really just integrated the whole world and made us all kumbaya and peaceful. Um, and so uh, history is, is, is considered quite problematic. Um, so there's lots of tiny numbers and I'm, I'm happy to share with you the publication. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight though a, key, a few key points um, about the debatability and how it's amplified by the press. Um, and what you'll see here in the tiny chart is that um, uh, journalists call racist things racist about 50% of the time. Um, that kind of goes with some of the work that I've done recently where lots of editors say we already do call racist things racist, which is great. Um, uh, and then what you're seeing here is um, a pretty damning to some degree because it's the number of times racism or racist was mentioned alongside white supremacy or white uh, privilege, which is in about 2% and 7% of coverage. And to me, these numbers spoke volumes about the lack of newsworthiness of white supremacy and white, white privilege or the avoidance. But then the real question is, is what, when does the media call racist things racist? How are they associated with these topics? And um, the subjects that I, that I found in this, this topic modeling um, and here are the keys here. Um, I was actually quite stunned by this. Um, why, why things had evolved over time. Um, what the results really show were that the odds of calling Trump or politicians or military police racist or involved in racism directly was really, really low. Um, but discussions of blackface and discussions of historical events had significantly higher odds of being connected directly with racism. 
um, and blackface having its historical roots, um, it really meant that there is quite a bit of confinement of what racist things being called racist is back to history. So back to, um, you know, before the 1968 policies were enacted. So some of the key takeaways that I had from that particular study um, just of the subjectivity cues, there's not actually a whole lot of scare quotes and there's not a, a lot of use of, of these rhetorical devices like allegedly racist, um, but there is quite a bit of positioning of waiting to call racist things racist until somebody else says it, which is this quotations, and then um, about 40% of coverage included denials of racism. There's this historical topic confinement, and then there's this avoidance of calling Trump racist. And there's more confidence in calling celebrities racist, but the avoidance of calling Trump and politicians racist was, was very eye-opening for me. Um, and, and there's also this topical avoidance of white supremacy and white privilege really contributing to the debatability of racism, really, really, really contributing to the status quo. So one of the problems with journalism is that they haven't figured out how to talk about racism. But the other problem with journalism and the protest paradigm and this idea that more legitimizing coverage could, could change what is happening is, is really that the grievance, the core grievance here is also wrapped up, especially when we're talking about police violence, the core grievance here is also wrapped up in a different set of stereotypes and frames that work against black people on a regular basis. You know, black people, especially in crime stories, are criminalized more often, dehumanized more often. Um, and, and police enjoy specific narratives as well. And so one of the things that I wanted to look at um, is really what's the connection between this protest coverage and how, like when they talk about the grievance the, the, in an episodic way, so someone who has died, what does that coverage look like? And how do we understand how legitimizing these debate frames or protest frames can be? How, how, can, we, how can we understand that? So um, I'm actually not really an optimist, uh, but I was quite optimistic when I started the study. Um, this was, Four years after, you know, consistent coverage of Black Lives Matter, um, when Stefan Clark was killed in the back, in the backyard, in his grandmother's backyard, and I really thought that the coverage of these protests that ensued would really break the mold um, and give me something different to write about, which I desperately wanted to see progress at that time. So this is 2018, if I didn't mention already. Um, so what I did was undertake a content analysis again of the coverage from the Sacramento Bee where, um, uh, where, where Clark was killed. Um, and then the California metropolitan, major California metropolitan newspapers and national newspapers. Um, and I originally I included the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, um, but there was so little coverage, I couldn't logically throw it into the sample. Again, this absence of coverage being um, really important to think about and theorize as we all move forward in thinking about protest coverage. Um, it also was an indicator that I should return <clears throat> to my pessimistic ways. Anyway, so I looked for frames of protest, um, riot, confrontation, and debate. And then um, I split up the debate frame to consider two things like we, we, I want to see the episodic debate so so someone is killed um, and and the mentions of that person and what that coverage looked like but also the more thematic demands and features meaning you know the police involvement and in the killing of Stefan Clark and in broader advocacy narratives like gun violence and systematic racism and um, poverty or economic inequality um, so I looked for the valence of, of, of how this episodic presentation of, of Clark happened and how was Clark portrayed, um, was it stereotypical, and, and what about police, so that we knew like when these, when these legit, so-called legitimizing features are included in coverage, how legitimizing can they be? Um, 
an important difference from this work from all the previous work is I look for just devices. So I was just looking for brief mentions. So the numbers are quite higher than sometimes some of, of my other work shows. Um, but I also wanted to, to build build our idea of what these frames are. So I, I did another analysis, a, a textual analysis of, of the most viral articles to sort of understand the landscapes there. Happy to talk about that, but I will breeze through that here um, because it's a, a bit more complicated to connect all the methods. Um, but in the end, when it comes to protests specifically, what the frequency showed, remember, of just these framing devices, it showed that the, the coverage focus on disruption blocking highways, there was no violence in these typically. So the potential for disruption was a big narrative, like there could be rioting or there could be violence. There was blo the blocking of streets and highways. There was a lot of attention to people not being able to get to um, the basketball games because <laughs> some of the basketball players um, struck, 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 striked striked not sure anyway um, some of the basketball players were involved in the advocacy um and 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 also a lot of the protesters you utilize those games to try to challenge and disrupt society so there's a lot of attention to that um and and that riot sort of frame is is really sort of thinking about that disruption and violent behavior and and the violent behavior here is really an attention to the potential for violent behavior but um it, oh oh and then if you look down there at the at the bottom we can see um that uh, the grievance um of of stefan clark being killed by police it did show up just casually about 80 percent of the time but if you look closer at like the relationship between that mention and the broader themes and really the contextual meat that would give this a full framing effect um what what we can see is that there is very little connection, 7.4% um, of that coverage is really connecting with, um, with racial injustice. And there is zero, zero connection with gun violence. Um, it, it, and you know, Stefan Clark's death was right around the time Parkland happened. It was very surprising that there wasn't some kind of even just individual mention of, of gun violence and how it how it affects people in different spaces, which I think is a narrative that is even more prevalent this week, um, as we see in the news. So then if we look in at really the coverage of if there's a ton of coverage of, of Stefan Clark being killed by police, then really um, wanted to look closer into how Stefan Clark was portrayed, what his life looked like. Um, and coverage, as you'll see highlighted, it, it really discussed him being killed and unarmed. And that was sort of that victim frame that was there um, that's very prevalent at 71.4% of coverage. Um, but it, a lot of this coverage is also questioning his accountability it is criminalizing him by bringing up his criminal history um it is talking about the potential that he engaged in deviant behavior before his death um and it's it is talking a lot about his accountability and it's it's not allowing him to be a victim it is questioning his potential victimhood what is really important though is not necessarily i mean this is the stereotypical look and 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 presentation of of a criminal this but this criminal is shot and killed by police and unarmed right what's really telling is that in the six months of coverage that i looked at is that police were not interrogated in the same way so using the same sort of topology what do we know about the police do we know anything about their employment history do we know anything about their potential accountability how do we look at these um at these a police and there's a real empowerment um, of police and sustaining of the system by granting them invisibility. Um, they were named 20 days after after the shooting of Stefan Clark. Um, and in six months of coverage, this is sort of the very minimal idea that we have um, of what these police are, who these police are and what they what they look like. Um, they are not glorified as heroes, um, as some scholars would say, like there's this glorification of the hero, of the hero cop. Um, but they're also not singled out as 
violent villains, right? Um, and, and that's really telling when you put that up against the demonizing and criminalizing coverage of Stefan Clark. What's more, I think, are the themes that really come from the viral narrative. So what gets redistributed at a higher rate over social media? And some of the themes that came out of that were this, one was a sensationalism of human injury. There was a ton of articles that were shared across social media that focused on the gruesome details of the autopsy, talking about broken bones, talking about, I mean, really talking about about what death felt like for, for Stefan Clark. And if you put that up against the fact that most coverage did not let Stefan Clark be a, a true victim, it's, it's very telling about the dehumanization of, of this man. Um, some of the other sensationalism of injury was that there was a white protester who was run over. And there's a, a quote in this article um, that I did not write down for this presentation. And I, I'm sad about that because it's very powerful. It, um, she says, I can't believe like the, the police um, aren't treating me like a human. It's devastating. It's just a really powerful quote that really humanizes protesters. Um, but it also makes the case that this is a white protester who was run over by police. Um, and so there's this this war with with how human who gets injured and when it matters in this sort of humanizing way. Um, there's also sort of an intersectional demonization that like that, that really um, speaks to a class issue. Um, there were several NBA stars that were involved in a lot of the activism. And there was a lot of coverage that in this most viral coverage that celebrated their um, actions. And these NBA players had had some questionable, I mean, they had enough to dig into them, right? Um, they had a questionable past, but that, that really, that was not present in these, in these really viral narratives. Um, but just considering like, these, these two black NBA star activists that paid for Stefan Clark's funeral and putting that alongside this, demoniz this demonization of, of black people of, of like Stefan Clark, I think it really build, builds this sort of, um, this intersection of class and race that we have to think about um, in a narrative that, that not only you know, cont contributes to the demonization of people, but also sort of helps marginalize people who might not be rich in a different way. Um, and then I also uh, noted that in the most viral narrative, there was a huge, because a white protester was run over, there was a, a big uptick in, in this discussion of police violence during protests. Um, that's not necessarily in the in the coverage, but is in the viral coverage. And I think that sort of speaks a little bit to what we saw in 2020, it's sort of an indicator, like people started to recognize this was a problem. And in 2020, when we have this you know, sensational headline that says police are rioting all over America, social media users had seen that they had they had they had seen that before and they had amplified that before um so i'm sure it was a welcome sort of uh, narrative to to many people who have paid close attention to this so in the end as we look back at this protest paradigm um and and how all these sort of things sort of work together is that you know journalism really is struggling with racism at so many different levels and it's simplistic and problematic um, to approach the, the solution as just including more of the legitimizing frame. Um, we have to dismantle white supremacy in the profession. Um, I don't have great solutions, but I, that's where my future work will, will likely travel. Um, I think that it's going to be really important to acknowledge white supremacy and white privilege um, and to you know, define racism uh, in a modern way. Many um, news organizations believe that they've already done that. And, um, you know, I think that figuring out what those boundaries are and how to push them, uh, what the boundaries of racism are and how to push them um, it is going to be really important. Um, and, and going beyond really um, overt racism, um, even overt racism as races really thinking about the system as being racist um, and how systems and institutions are racist. I think we really have to be able to put all of these things together in our style books and in, in our, you know, in news organization, in our, in our education, right? And how we teach people to, um, to be able to really make a difference and figure out what's right. 
Um, and I mean, in the end, it's really stopping racism as a dirty word and finding ways to believe in racism, to defy debatability, and to push forward with a narrative that that privileges, you know, that really does comfort the afflicted. Um, <clears throat> until we do, I think that this hierarchy of social struggle will stay quite stable. Um, Judith Butler calls the the um, the uh, sort of push and pull of, of women's rights dynamically stable. And I think that that's precisely what we'll see here, that, that, that this hierarchy is going to be dynamically stable. Um, one of the things in our work that we couldn't do is really tag down, like, where is immigration and women's rights on this hierarchy? We know it's above this, but where else could it be? And I think, you know, these things, as they intersect with race, they will also fall up and down on this hierarchy. We have to really overthrow uh, or to overthrow the hierarchy of social struggle and to overthrow the protest paradigm, we have to reckon with racism and change the way that we understand it. Um, other ways will be in this sort of dynamically stable space. And I think that the hierarchy of social struggle will continue. Um, so I will stop there and I hope that I can take your questions. Thank you so much, Danny. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so much to on it. And we have, as you would imagine, a ton of questions already. Um, so I, I want to start out just by recognizing that we have a whole host of our graduate students um, who are with us today. And um, one of the reasons that we established this talk was to, um, to have scholars like you connect with our grad students. So I'd like to invite them um, to ask some questions um, and you know, be, be part of the conversation, even though we're not here in person and I can, I can you know, sort of physically encourage them, I'd like to virtually encourage them. Um, so I'd like to start out in that, uh, in that arena. So your research is fascinating. As a matter of fact, I've started researching, researching the coverage of Black Lives Matter in media um, after getting to read your research. Um, a few questions. Um, could you talk a little bit more about subjectivity cues and topic modeling? How does that specific piece of your methodology work? And then also, and another uh, another person has the same question. Do you see differences um, in reporting between television and newspapers or digital outlets? Um, and then finally, from this one person, um, is there a reason you haven't used um, some of the more famous or possibly infamous right-leaning news media? Okay, I'm going to take notes. There's a lot in there, right? Let's look at it. <laughs> Let me, I'm going to start with the methodology question. Um, so the subjectivity cues, I wasn't able to pull, I, I wanted to learn machine learning. I didn't, I started off hand coding. Um, if anybody has completed a content analysis with bigger sets of data uh, and, and the reviewers are continuously requiring huge sets of data, um, it's, it's quite, it's quite hard. It's hard to keep reliability. It's hard to make things be as complex and, and nuanced as, as, as work could have been in the past because we're not at, we can't do a content analysis of 77 articles. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people will continuously add you, ask you to add more. And that was my experience on a regular basis. So, so part of me, including topic modeling here was to try to get a bigger sample and to try to um, be able to do that with some sort of reliability. Um, so the subjectivity cues were easy, to some degree easier to find once I figured out like allegedly, I could go look for those words in that post in that text, um, you know, do easy word finds, some of that sort of seemingly comp computational and it, it sort of cut down the number of variables that you would have to look out for each post and increase the ability to have reliability and validity over the course of time. So those were done by hand for, for the most part. And then topic modeling, these more complex sort of, how am I gonna categorize, um, you know, 140 posts <laughs> in, in looking at them over and over and over again. Um, topic modeling was an amazing approach to be able to do that, that really let me sort of do um, really fast paced qualitative work. Um, it, it is sort of how I came to reckon with it. So. So to me, it was helpful sort of in, in moving beyond just press coverage of text at a, at a smaller level and sort of expanding what I knew. Um, 
uh, in the in the context of social media, but also from broadcast and television networks. So that particular article had like ABC, NBC, CBS, but also New York Times, Reuters, AP. Like I, it really just gave me the chance to be able to put them all together. And and when I said journalism, I wasn't really saying just New York Times, right? I was saying like broader journalism. So um, so so I hope I answered that question. I think there was another question about differences between digitally, like digitally natives and different mediums, I guess, in which. Yeah, um, mainly, mainly a difference between television and text, I guess is the way I would, I would um, frame it. So I have not found a lot of differences in the overall patterns there. What I can say is that it's interesting. It's an interesting question um, about how we analyze news coverage from television, especially these major news networks, because of the commentators, right? They are sometimes talking about the news, but they are also who they are. <laughs> and how, how, do we, how do we compare that with traditional journalism? Because their stuff is not about norms and routines. This is about whatever they want to come out of their mouth at the moment. <laughs> this traditional journalism, I mean, when we compare traditional news that comes out of Fox, CNN and MSNBC, there's not a whole lot of differences. When you throw in the commentators, that's when we see a big, a big difference. So I, so in the end, I, I think that journalism works a lot like journalism works. There are, there are very, you know, significant differences in, in how things are presented and how much sensationalism is there and how the moving picture works with words, especially on television. But, um, but, but the, I think one of the biggest, um, differences that you'll see is is who included commentators in their analysis and who did not because that's really where um, that sort of polarizing binary lies awesome that that's that provides a great segue to um, my colleague Doug McLeod king of the king of the protest paradigm um, who asks uh, said, first of all says wonderful talk and, and we all agree um, have you shared your research with journalists at all and if so how do they respond I'm so honored for you to be here today. I wish I could meet you in person. Uh, this is like a superstar. Oh, we'll make, we'll make that happen. We will make that happen post pandemic. Um, so yes, I've shared my research with journalists. I, I, this has been a journey for me because I, I couldn't ever really, I never really wanted to be just the person that published stuff. Like this idea of only 10 people reading your articles made me cringe in grad school. Like, why am I doing this? You know? So yeah, I really wanted to be able to engage. And I have done that, you know, as, as often as I could try to get it in the hands of journalists. At first, before 2020, there was a ton of resistance. Like, you're not gonna call me racist. <laughs> you're not gonna say I did this wrong. I I know I'm not biased, you're biased. I literally had a, a, um, a editor from a, a newspaper tell me that my data was wrong. <laughs> so I was like, wow, this is, this is fun. I've sat down with the, I've sat down with that editor, and we had a very long talk. And I told explained what limitations are and archiving and things like that. But uh, it was it was hard. Um, twenty twenty changed that drastically, um, drastically. And really, I mean, I was really glad to have a canon behind me to say like, you think you did it right, but you didn't do it right for a really long time, <laughs> which is why you really have to do it right now. Um, and I've, I got to uh, recently present in um, all the McClatchy Southeast um, newsrooms, and they just were incredibly responsive to um, to change, to opportunities to like think about, you know, series reporting. Like if you have an episodic feature of a protest, make sure there's, you know, you push it upstream and you really think about um, the thematic influences that are they're making these people be in this position. Um, and a lot of, I mean, just a lot of really responsive newsrooms. Um, I know now that I'm doing a little bit more work, sort of trying to figure out how do these DEI positions play a role in helping sort of move along protest coverage. And from that, I can tell you that the, the, the protest coverage changes are slow moving, right? They, there's not a lot of change. They heard what we had to say, <laughs> but there's not a whole lot of, change yet they're trying to figure out how to implement it and and how to how to do it um in a way that 
both the, as one person described it, the journalists with the Molotov cocktails that are ready to like blow up the system and are super progressive and are ready, are ready for this so that they can catch on as well as sort of the, you know, the, the heroes <laughs> and the, the legendary journalists who are really, you know, pushing, really clinging to traditional ethical codes because that's what journalism is and how it's been defined for so long. So I think it's, it's a, um, there's a lot of give and take with um, how this advice is being used. Um, and yeah, it will left to be seen where, where we're gonna go from here. I hope there's, uh, I mean, I'm glad there's just a little note of optimism there that um, that, that maybe um, we can shift when there's a, when there is a, a moment of cultural reckoning as you um, talked about it. I wanna come back to um, something that really stood out to me in your talk when you're talking about um, reviewer number one and that, and that comment. Um, you know, I, I have a colleague um, at another institution who has been doing work um, with a little bit, a little bit more attention on critical race theory in ethics and law, and is finding that um, what had been a pretty seamless path for her, she's a senior scholar, um, to publication is is far bumpier now that she is taking on issues of race, and um, as a white woman finds it found it really quite striking, uh, really eye opening for her. So I'm going to turn to um, a question from another colleague uh, who's at a different institution, Avery Holton, who, um, who writes, this is such good work and thank you for the presentation. Thank you for taking on such a complex and emotionally connected issue. If you're comfortable with the question, could you speak a bit about the emotional labor that goes into your work and how you see emotional labor or overall labor taking a toll on those who your research engages? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Avery, uh, and thanks for being here. Um, I, I I will just note that I, I've never been able to, to successfully publish a article that weaves in critical race theory with the protest paradigm, and I know it is absolutely 100% relevant, right? I curse a lot at my computer desk. <laughs> I think that that's part of the emotional labor of that. Um, but I have never been able to do that. I am grateful that the protest paradigm has provided a structure in which I can start to enter, enter you know, publication after publication, a conversation where it is undeniable that CRT is relevant. But, um, but a lot of what I've gone through in terms of researching this is rejection. Is, is is rejection of an idea is having to remold it literally take an idea that is very true and remold it using a theory that is not even that relevant <laughs> right um i it, it's really it's been really difficult to see people like wb du, du, Bois, du Bois, um sort of pushed aside as a theorist in our in our work um it's been really um, disheartening to see some of the research that my, um, you know, black colleagues and scholars have done sort of not be cited in the way that other people who take advantage of moments sometimes, right? They're like, oh, this is newsworthy. I really, I'm a journalist at heart, I think, <laughs> but this is newsworthy. I really want to research it, you know, and, and that comes at a cost for people who always think it's newsworthy to him and to them and always research it. So, um, so I think for me, it, it is, it's, it's difficult. I have, I have found great joy in being able to talk to newsrooms. I know that that's a um, that can be a problem for tenure. Sometimes <laughs> I can show impact, but sometimes it's not like the currency of some you know the way some faculties work. I, I'm lucky that now I'm at a university where it most definitely is taken into account, but. Um, that that labor of being able to say, I'm not going to talk about racism the same way every single time because I'm going to change it. Right? I'm going to change how you write about it. I'm going to be an advocate for journalists who are who are in that space because I have the research that they need. They don't have an IRB. They don't have time for a postmortem. They don't they don't have that. And that's the scholarship I produce. So I think for me, that moment of being in their newsrooms and being able to like do something about it, it, it is 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 important because lots of things evolve, right? I mean, digital digital technology scholars, like they've got all kinds of stuff all the time and racism 
doesn't evolve. It, it it may present itself differently, but it doesn't evolve. And and I, I I've got it. I mean, a ton of rejections come from, but we already knew that was going to happen. <laughs> you know, we, when you study something like like protests that were that were de delegitimized, like the the answer is, but we already knew that was going to happen. How did you build theory? And I'm like, you know, well, I don't guess we can build a theory of racism if it's static. So, um, so to me, I think that being having this moment to be able to talk to journalists um, has been incredibly useful. I, as I talk to journalists now, especially journalists of color, I think that this moment is also reinvigorating for them because they have not been silent in their newsrooms over time. They have been complicit in some some points because they want to keep their jobs and they want to find a space there where they can have their voices heard. And that takes staying in the industry, right? But I think that this moment really has given them an opportunity to be heard, whether or not that will transpire into policy change and um, and and you know practice change or routine changes is left to be seen. It's been a year, and most of many people are like, it hasn't changed yet, but I still have hope. Ish. Yep. So, <laughs> so I think that um, you know the emotional labor of racism is is hard. It, it it's hard beyond emotions too. Um, but there are some there are some you know there's there's joy in living through it. So. Um, so that's how I would probably conclude that. Well, thanks. That's so meaningful. Um, another of uh, another of our colleagues, Devon Shaw, writes great talk with a clear through line of your program of scholarship and providing rich details. So thank you very much. Could you expand a bit on your um, previous reflection of the racial dimensions of gun violence, gun, gun violence coverage? And Devon and uh, a number of our grad students do work in this area. Um, we're particularly interested in your sense of race as it intersects with being a shooter versus being a victim of gun violence. Sure, and, and thank you for being here again. <laughs> I'm really super honored to have you here. Um, so. My interest in, in this as a gun violence narrative really came from many of the mothers of Black Lives or, or of victims that um, when they entered into this advocacy sphere were really trying to talk about gun violence, both the gun violence that's happening in their communities and the gun violence that's happening from police. Um, and that narrative has been squashed several times. <laughs> like this is just about police violence. And I think that um, uh, you know, just sort of understanding that police violence is gun violence is really important. What made, I think, you know, George Floyd's death different is that there was no gun and we were in a pandemic and watching it over and over again. But, um, but, but gun violence sort of left the narrative there, but it was always a part of all of these previous, um, all of these previous cases. Um, you know, many of the police officers of color that have been prosecuted have been prosecuted while, while white police officers have not. And their narrative, and this isn't something I've looked at empirically, but their narratives um, are quite different in terms of how how much we know about those police officers and how much um, we know about who shot who. Um, and and I think that that's one important thing that I would I would call it about race of race of, of the shooter when it comes to police violence. Um, but I think as we're seeing sort of now, um, you know, while I can point out to this sort of demonization of black people who are killed by guns, we see today, you know, this sort of like invisibility of the stories of six elderly Asian women who are killed by a mass shooter. Um, and, and, you know, sort of this, again, this invisibility of, of that shooter or, or this really, you know, um, protection of that shooter's possible innocence is, is this other frame that sort of is you see today that you also see in police coverage, right? Um, that with the sheriff giving the unfortunate soundbite of, of um, the shooter um, in Atlanta as having a bad day, right? Uh, police also having a bad day. Um, I think that, I think that it, this is all racialized. It's all very, um, to me very easy to, to see how people, white people with guns are protected or a protected class, um, both in coverage, but also by the official sources who are describing them. Um, and so, so to me, again, this is one of those, like we have to interrogate what we call officiality 
how we see things as official, how scared we are of libel, right? <laughs> I mean, how scared are we of libel, really? <laughs> and then and then how many of our journalists are doing that because they're scared of libel or just because they think that's the way they're supposed to do it? And and what are their protections and how do, how do they move forward with that? I think that that's, that's sort of the way in which we can see these shooter narratives change. Okay, I'm like writing down all these notes about <laughs> potential research collaborations. Um, so from Lindsay Palmer, who says a personal hello. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether you see references to gender surfacing in the journalistic representations of these police murders and the resulting protests. I know you've been following um, Brianna Taylor's murder, for example. Do you think gender complicates or changes these discourses? Um, or do you think news organizations represent um, the murder of women in similar ways? Oh, no, they don't represent them at all that there's part of that paradigm is intersectionality and that's where black women who are killed by police go and the things that don't get covered again like there's so many bottom things. Of the, that are bottom of the pyramid, yep. the very, very bottom, which is just sort of like a, a two sentence thing in, in my in my article, <laughs> um, but is a really, really important piece because yeah, they just don't get covered. They just don't show up. We didn't pick those themes on purpose. We did all the coverage from these different news organizations. And there's just not a lot of coverage of police violence against women. Um, in fact, that's where that's where my dissertation started. I wanted to look at coverage of black women who are who are killed by police, um, really building off the work of Beth Ritchie, who made it very clear there are no articles <laughs> of police violence against black women or, or of um, the criminal systems violence or yeah, the justice systems violence against black women. Um, there was an article there. I, I had worked as a grad student in Jasper, Texas, which is where James Ward Jr. was lynched. And um, when I was there, there was a woman who was dragged behind a truck. There's two articles about her, that was it. I was in the city when this happened. She was dragged behind a truck by her white boyfriend. And the coverage there said, and, and Beth Ritchie was the one who pointed this out in her book to me, right? I never saw it. Beth, it, it the coverage said that she um, was gonna go do drugs and, and have sex with her boyfriend, but they got into an argument and then he dragged her behind the truck and that was, that was the article. <laughs> um, she was denied her victimhood, for sure, sexualized, criminalized, and then erased, um, as somewhat deserving it. I think it's interesting, it's always been interesting how many people, how people come out for certain issues, and, and this invisibility of Black women in this coverage is, is, has been rampant. Breonna Taylor is very different. Um, and comes up on, I guess, sort of this racial reckoning that we had with George Floyd, but even when she, she was killed, that wasn't in the national news on a regular basis, that wasn't part of discourse on a regular basis, it would have fallen into the shadows if we hadn't had George Floyd, which is kind of a devastating association with the two. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, I think there's an a, invisibility. I don't hear journalists talking about it enough. I hear lots of black women speaking out about it. Um, and I, I think that um, I, I'm not sure how that can change. I think we have to, we also have to dismantle how patriarchy works in, in the system. Um, but it's hard to do that as a quantitative scholar without data. <laughs> I have my experience. And I have my 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 personal experience, and I think that I think that that says a lot about things. Um, but you know, it would be really nice to have data. Brianna Taylor was the first time we had data, so um, so I look forward to being able to complete that research, and right. and start that conversation of of the need to talk about intersectionality and and um, and and women generally. So just to, just to follow up on that, um, do you think that the that the um, say her name hashtag campaign wouldn't have been successful if it were not for George Floyd? That, that it just didn't gain traction until that point? I guess I did. I guess I hadn't really pondered that before. But when I think about when I saw it the most, it certainly was after George Floyd was murdered. Right, because if you had if you had seen say her name start after Sandra Bland, you would have probably been looking at the root, or you would have been looking at a black newspaper. I um, pulled the coverage for that 
also as a grad student to try to do an analysis and realize I can't do it the way I know how to because the coverage was so little. I was fooled by this idea that it was a successful movement because my own social media patterns had seen it a lot, right? I was connected mm. with the network, um, but that didn't get a lot of coverage after Sandra Bland. I didn't get a lot of coverage after the Jerry Becton was another national news story where um, that was also known as the McKinney Pool Girl more often than her actual name. So um, women, yeah, the, the Say Her Name movement did not get a lot of, it was there and established. And, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw really, had, her whole life is dedicated to it to some degree, um, but it did not become more mainstream until Breonna Taylor. Oh, okay. Um, a question from um, Gustavo Uribe. So how how do we avoid becoming subjective in terms of judging um, news or newspapers and, and separating emotions from rationalism? Like, is it is it feasible in this uh, in this time to to separate those and not become subjective? So a larger question. And, and there's an earlier question relating to um, objectivity and subjectivity in this arena. Yeah, thanks for the question um, and thanks for being here. I would argue that um, objectivity is a myth um, and that subjectivity has always been a part of how we know and understand journalism. It became how we developed our practices. It became how we develop our newsroom cultures um, and objectivity is, is cannot be fulfilled. It's like saying I can take I can literally be an observer that doesn't interact and has no ideas and comes at everything with a blank slate. And that simply has been proven time after time again that it's not true. So for me, it's less about becoming subjective and just saying like, well, just report whatever you want to because we don't want to say that either. Like we want to have boundaries, right? But it's, I think for me, it's about thinking about what all of the other super important parts of journalistic ethics have said. <laughs> like, what about centering this idea that we comfort the afflicted <laughs> and we afflict the comfortable? <laughs> Our comfortable happened to be Ted Cruz when he goes to Cancun <laughs> when Texas is frozen, right? <laughs> Our comfortable happened to be the very rich po po uh, politicians or the police who can hide behind their police wall and not give you any information about stuff. Those are comfortable people. What we see when we see protests are uncomfortable people, people who are scared for their lives, people who are scared for the lives of other people, people who do not want to worry about their children's leaving the house every single day. They're done, they're tired, they're over it. So I think that one of the one of the things that we should be doing is talking about one, how do how are we fair to these communities because we have not been. And then two, how do we restore our ethical codes and know that we have to engage in equitable practices because we've already devastated these communities for centuries like so many of the i mean historically so many of the lynchings that so many of you know bombings of black communities so many so many terrible things were completely and totally instigated by the press by by journalists adhering to their ethical codes saying yes look bad person right um mm -hmm. and allowing officials to have that narrative so i think that that's it's it's really important to acknowledge that and know that that's not subjective history that's that is the history, um, and we cannot, we can no longer whitewash that. Really, really fascinating. Um, I, I want to just jump to your, um, you know, you started out as a photojournalist professionally, right, as a visual communicator. So yeah. we have um, a question from another visual communicator here on campus, um, Michael King. Um, have you looked at visual communication, specifically photojournalism, broadcast video news, um, and, and analyzed um, the visual aspects of this? I have, I have, in a couple of different scenarios. Um, one, in terms of the numbers, um, I've, I've just sort of counted the numbers and, and adapted the protest paradigm scheme to coverage. And my dissertation, I did that with Black Lives Matter. Um, and in concert with some other scholars, I've done that with um, protests uh, in Ayotzinapa, Mexico. And in both cases, what I found is that uh, photojournalists have a penchant for fire, if there is a fire. But when there's not a fire, they really like funky signs, like signs that say funky things. <laughs> There's things that like might catch the attention of people. Those are really dramatic 
pictures. There's also, I mean, a ton of um, of pictures that that, but, but not necessarily captions that do center police, right? Which makes it even even more interesting. Is that like the the visual person can there is there and can see it and can 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 frame it in the context of 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 what's happening of this event. Um, but the writers and the editors and you know the complete story doesn't end up reflecting that police behavior. Um, so so I so this emphasis on science is really what both of those articles come out with is that maybe multimedia is really pushing forward the debate frame, um, and text is coming back and and sort of reeling it back in. And that's when we talk about you know massive pictures, but pictures as you know become iconic very quickly, and and fire pictures um, tend to stay in the minds of people that aren't affiliated with the movement. And so the other part of my dissertation was really trying to figure out how white and black people um, see these images differently, which is drastically differently and how they remember them differently is drastically different. Um, and uh, another way in which this delegitimizing, legitimizing binary is really sort of short-sighted. Um, but, uh, but there, you know, one picture can mean so much to someone. One mishap can start a hashtag if they gun me down. Um, you know, one one picture of a of a protest rioter can can change the mind of someone thinking that the whole thing was a riot, right? And so, um, so, so visual journalists have a correcting this in visual journalism is is a hard job because it really um, has to do with this like individual psychology and how people process and see and remember specific images and it's really unfortunate how much people remember violence and how people how much people um find images that are stereotypical very accessible in their brain um and so so that's where i would say like um there's lots of work to do there yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, so I think we have time for um, a couple more questions, and I'm going to turn to one of our wonderful graduate students, Janice Lee. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, and as a graduate student, I appreciate your honesty in talking about the publication process for those who do anti-racism research. I wonder if you could share your thoughts on whether the network publics on social media and citizen journalism have potential to provide a counterforce to how mainstream media cover protests and movements, and in turn, then shape journalism practices. Absolutely. So my research in that respect has mostly looked at like how social media, um, social media audiences reshare news and how that sort of re-aggregates what these patterns would look like. And they kind of, they sometimes do dismantle some of, of the paradigm, right? So sometimes they are more, for example, in the Stefan Clark paper, they are more in tune to this coverage of police violence. They are more in tune to, they, they react more favorably towards um, the legitimizing frames in some cases. But I think that, you know, the a legion of scholars like um, Meredith Clark, I think is Sarah J. Jackson, um, and their, their work sort of associated with hashtag publics is really, um, it, they are really the leading scholars in terms of talking about how, how this counter spaces unravel what the press is doing. Um, and and it, I think it is important to think about them in concert, right? Like how can this be both a positive and a negative, but with, with journalism and having its, you know, straight lined ethical codes, it's easier to sort of like see where they are the problem. Um, I will also just say that um, some of my work has looked at has looked at like digitally native um, and alternative media to to really sort of dig into what does this media landscape look like when we talk about actual journalism produced and maybe not just hashtag conversations. Um, and what I found is that uh, over and over again is that alternative media does what alternative radical activist media have, has always done. It's done it in favor of, of, of protest, um, but also digitally native media like, like Mick or like Buzzfeed, they've also done a, like, I mean, a, just a statistically different job at representing protests, still really um, attached to the sensational, but also, um, also more invested in producing the debate frame than mainstream media is. Um, and I think a lot of that is because they're more diverse. They tend to be more diverse. They also tend to have different um, objectivity codes in which they navigate um, and they, um, they, they, they bend the rules when they want to, right? <laughs> so, um, so it's really seen these, um, 
these noise organizations sort of unravel what this sort of mainstream paradigm is. Uh, so uh, Christine Hovey asks if this um, it says thank you to Danielle, thank you so much for doing the work you're doing, but asks if there's going to be a recording available for sharing and yes, there will. Um, this talk will be posted to um, the School of Journalism and Mass Communication YouTube channel. So um, we would welcome uh, any sharing anyone wants to do. Um, so from an anonymous attendee, could you provide some insights on the audience perception of these news narratives, especially when it comes to online engagement? Sure. Um, yeah, I can talk. I can talk a lot about online online engagement. I think there's a lot of um, engagement with a lot more engagement than we ever expected on in routine um, routine sort of analyses of how this press coverage is shared or interacted with across the, the across Facebook and Twitter primarily. Um, there's more interaction a lot of times with the debate frame than there is with the riot frame, which we thought you know riots with probably get more interaction because they're more polarizing or whatever it is. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, and I think more often than um, not, there are some of these legitimizing features that the social media really like latches on to. Something about these articles they latch on to and, and they happen to have these legitimizing features, I should say. Um, so we see that on a regular basis. Um, in terms of, it, like with Facebook, there's also this, I mean, with the emotion engagements, um, I have a, an article coming out called the hearts and ha ha's of the public, but it doesn't have an actual emoji in the title. And I just saw an article come out that has an emoji in the title and I'm a little jealous. So um, <laughs> uh, what we find there is that like, Ang like angry sentiments are really associated with the riot frame and that, you know, um, crying sentiments are associated with more of the debate frame. So really, you know, the emotional, the way that um, emotion is tied to these specific frames um, is, is important too, and, and important to think about because, because emotion is at the heart of why people engage in the collective action in the, in the first place. So, um, so there's a lot of nuance there, um, but uh, but there there are some like very key themes about especially with anger and uh, sadness where they fit into this broader model of engagement. Um, let me think. Social media engagement. I think I think that's that's all I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> there's one more. <laughs> So I'm going to close with um, with just two last questions um, from my colleague Mike Wagner, um, and uh, who is who is side texting me that it's killing him that we're not together in person, so that we could be um, having hours and hours and hours of discussion. So consider this an open invitation to come back for those hours and hours of discussion. Um, so uh, Mike Mike writes, this is such a rich talk, and I'd like to ask you to speculate a bit about potential interventions to engage in with journalists um, to push them toward coverage they need to be engaging, um, they need to be engaging in to overthrow the protest paradigm. And um, so imagine running an experiment with a population of journalists and the dependent variables are similar to the ones you use. Could you share some of the facts, uh, could you share some facts of a case and act, ask journalists to write the lead or first graphs of a story as an, as an intervention? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be a fascinating experiment. <laughs> I mean, a quite fascinating, um, actually, good idea. Um, and thanks for being here. <laughs> but also, I, I think, I, I think there's a step before that, though, and it's it, and it is really getting them to recognize that there's a different frame there. Like all these frames exist in unison, and you picked this one because it was most prevalent to you in that space and you didn't pick this one somewhere else. Um, and I think that that's one of the most unfortunate things I think about the protest paradigm is that the riot frame is called the riot frame and I keep trying to change it, but like people don't like to change theory. <laughs> so um, it should be called a disruptive frame, right? That we, we can pay attention to violence and we can get different levels of disruption, but this is about disruption to society and it's in its most masterful 1999, a multi-perspectival art or what is that a chapter in 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 the framing book that's what it says it's a disruption to society and that's really important because riot is also blocking highways you are disrupting society right it is also the potential to disrupt a society which disrupts society so um I think that really getting them to recognize that all of these frames are are there all of all kinds of protests the women's march also that we 
applauded as the nonviolent protest. <laughs> It wasn't violent, but it still was disruptive, right? It's disruptive all over the world. <laughs> and and that's really not the feature of that. It was, a, I mean, the spectacle of the hats and the signs was there, obviously, but there was a lot more ability to, to attach to um, what the protesters needed and what they, what they wanted to say and how they wanted to say it. I think one of the biggest disconnects between journalists is not necessarily getting them to figure out how to write the same things differently, it's really getting them to, to connect with racism, <laughs> like connect with it, understand what it is, understand how it affects your community, because then it won't be invisible to you when you walk out and you see it, then, then people's pain won't be minimized, to, you know, like it is so often in our press, like it, it is in our heads because they're not the pictures that we have. I think, you know, the more that people understood, People understood what anti-Trump protesters were about, <laughs> journalists did, and they reported it better. They understood that Trump was also affiliated with immigration <laughs> in, and the protests that were there, and they reported it better. They understood women's rights to some degree, probably not enough, but some. And they reported the women's march at least better. And they don't understand what's happening in indigenous communities. And so the Dakota pipeline falls right back down there with what's happening in black communities, which is also undercovered. Um, and is so often focused on negative attributes of these communities that, that, it, that it's hard to find the joy and it's hard to find the struggle, right? It's, it's easy to find the crime. And so I think that you know, the, the true solution is to say, hey, read a book in the nicest way possible. <laughs> Talk to some black people, maybe have dinner with them a couple of times, pay for it um, <laughs> and learn what your community is about so that you have a core understanding that's that's natural, um, like we do for other social justice issues. Yeah, and I, I do need to apologize to Mike because what I read as two questions was actually one long question, and so I, I did miss um, some of the nuance of the set of his part two. Uh, but you know, Mike has done some interesting work in this um, in in this arena with um, uh, healthcare journalists, giving them um, uh, some experimental work, giving them some stimuli, and then having them write a lead or a few follow up um, paragraphs to the story. So it's really there's some real potential there. Um, you know, he writes that he was really struck by the findings about what's not present in coverage and then notes, and I think this is really interesting and you see this in some ethics work as well, um, that you know, playing to what journalists traditionally say they value, things like balance, um, could be a way to you know, intervene and get them to bring, bring other things in the story that they, into stories that they don't currently bring in. Um, so things about uh, an officer's um, uh, prior record um, coming into a story very, uh, almost immediately um, upon an incident. So I think that's really interesting. Uh, but uh, Mike takes a little slam at the Green Bay Packers because he's a native <laughs> Minnesotan. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not throwing that out there for you, Danny. Um, I, you know, I think in terms of, of um, you know, hopefulness when it comes to busting those traditional values, I think one of the really most fascinating developments um, since uh, since the killing of George Floyd was the Kansas City Star's um, uh, investigative piece into its own journalism. Um, so, you know, and, and you're right, it, I, I believe it was a little bit of a Molotov cocktail from the inside being thrown from the fires coming from inside the house. Um, and I, I just would absolutely love to see um, more of that. And I really applaud you uh, for your dedication to getting out and engaging um, with journalists and, and um, with other communities and taking and, and finding this bridge between the important research that you do and the practices that affect all of us. I really, I think it's, I just think it's so tremendously creative and important. So with that, um, we are unfortunately right out of time um, and we don't have everybody triggered with their, um, with their video, but I know that they are joining me and applauding you and thanking you, Danny, for coming and being with us today. This is so, so important. I hope all of you who joined us will share the video um, once it's available um, because I know it will be, um, I, I know uh, lots and lots of people can learn from what we covered here today. Um, in the Q&A you're getting lots of applause. <laughs> Uh, so again, um, Danny, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, let's make post-pandemic plans to get you down to Madison and have okay. some of the rich multi-hour talks um, and, and possibly plot some, uh, some joint research projects. I would love that. I love that. Thank you so much for All having me. Right. Thank you, Danny. And thanks to all of you for joining us. We really, really appreciate it.
Bye. Thank you.